Sport Fishing on the Fly is brought to you by Togan's Fly Shop, Maui Jim Sunglasses, and Hardy Rods and Reels. Well, Bri, pretty exciting what we're planning on doing, isn't it? <laughs> well, you know, like first for everybody, it's the Sport Fishing on the Fly, you know, fly fishing tips with the masters. And of course, uh, Brian and my my age and other people will have involved. We are masters, aren't we, Brian? <laughs> We've earned the right to be called that. <laughs> exactly. And it's going to be tips. You know, we plan to do one of these every month or, uh, you know, a couple of months going forward. We're going to really focus on the still waters and get everybody dialed in. So it is going to be full of great information for everybody. So let's get going. I know we want to start right away. We want to keep these to about 20 minutes. So I'm going to ask Brian a few questions and I'll chime in where I have to. So, you know, we're going to start with chronomids. Why do we fish chronomids, Brian? You know, we, this is something new, Don, and we definitely, if we're going to start with anything, it's going to be our, our first love, and that's chronomids. And it's, it's just a simple fact that there's so many chronomids species in our, found in our productive still waters. It's the most prolonged hatch of the year. There's a diverse abundance of size and color. So it's, it, it's, it's not a guessing game. It's, it's something we got to approach more scientifically and it's indicator watching in uh, a lot of it, although we're not going to talk about indicators today, it, uh, it, it's just a wonderful hatch that you can fish pretty well the entire season long. Yeah, that's a big thing is that duration of the hatch. You know, you've got it essentially spring through to fall. You've got the hatch, you've got multiple species right in and the, and the deep and shallow water. Exactly. You, you got to cover it all, don't you? No. So now, quick review of the chronomid life cycle. So quickly, uh, chronomids have a complete life cycle. So they have an egg, a larva, pupa, and adult stage. And actually the only other still water aquatic insect that has the same life, complete life cycle are caddisflies egg, larva, caddis, pupa, and adult. Everybody else in that lake has um, an incomplete uh, life cycle with a nymphal stage, no pupal stage. Yeah. So chronomids have a complete life cycle. Uh, we will start with the chronomid larvae, which lives in the mud water interface at the bottom of the lake. And it could be in five feet of water, three feet of water, or it could be in 95 feet of water. Any, any depth zone basically they can, those larvae can live in. And the reason why they can live in such deep water is because their circulatory system has a hemoglobin-like uh, substance that allows them to live in almost uh, complete uh, off, depleted oxygen water or anoxic water. So that's why we have hatches down at such great depths. So regardless of whether the larvae are living in five feet or 95 feet, the larvae which we call bloodworms typically because they're segmented and they're worm-like. Uh, they live in tubes, they build tubes at the bottom of the lake in that mud water interface and they stick their heads out and their pro legs out and they feed on detritus, decomposing plant matter and other bits of organic matter that's down at whatever depth they're living. And uh, the most common larval colors are that bloodworm, uh, maroon, red color, but you also see variety of uh, shades of green, uh, brown, you can sometimes you'll see even almost black ones, but the predominant color is maroon, red, and then followed by green. So those typical chronomid larvae spend one year in the larval stage. Although the bigger species like we call bombers, those great big ones we see that hatch, um, will often have a two year larval stage. So they're in the mud bottom interface for up to two years. But typical larvae, one year, and then it seals itself in its little worm-like uh, case at the bottom and, and it completes a metamorphosis from the, or transformation from the larval stage to the pupa stage. In that tube, at the bottom of the lake in five feet, 95 feet, and everywhere in between. And then once that transformation is completed, the now fully developed pupa will break out of that old larval shock and begin that ascent to the surface of the lake. And 
uh, the, the pupa gathers or builds up gas under its cuticle, its exterior skin, which makes them silvery right. or uh, glassy colored in appearance, that gas stuff. And that's what helps make that ascent to the surface of the lake. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine in, in five feet of water, it might only take 20 seconds to get to the surface of the lake. But in 55 feet of water, it might take <laughs> four or five minutes. And it's a dangerous voyage to the yeah. surface of the lake. So the pupa get to the surface of the lake and immediately a uh, split forms in the back of its thorax and the adult chronomid crawls out and basically flies off to shore. And that evening or the next morning, the mating will occur along the riparian shoreline areas of the lake. And the females will come back that evening or the next morning, uh, usually when it's usually calm out, less wind and low light conditions. And then they'll skim across the surface of the lake. They'll dip the tip of their abdomen into the surface film and uh, they'll release the eggs of the next generation. The eggs will, are, will sink, will eventually sink to the bottom of the lake at whatever depth she's, she's releasing oh, them at. Yeah. And, uh, the cycles repeated. Oh, really? So that, that's that's the chronomid life cycle. And we can see from that that the most vulnerable times or the most preferred times for trout to be feeding on this species, on this insect is in the larval stage and then certainly in the pupa stage because they're helpless. All they're doing is elevating, rising to the surface plate so they can't swim and dart, get out of the way. And then if the trout need to, they can eat the adults that are sitting on the water just prior to taking off, or they can chase down uh, the returning females that are making a V wake in the surface film when they're laying eggs. But by far, there's no question the majority of the feeding occurs on the pupa stage, followed by the larval stage, and then the adult stages. Which we love. And you know, that's the thing you mentioned too, is you have to have the variety of fishing techniques to be able to catch them. Right, you see your blood worms on the bottom, right? The pupil. So, you know, uh, we like the indicators, but you got to have it all, don't you? Uh, no, obviously, the, in the shallow water patches, you know, up to 20, 25 feet in depth, will often be suspending under an indicator or will be long line nymphy naked with a floating line and long tapered leader. Yeah. But there's these hatches that do come off in deep water, and that's the, the deep water hatches that we're going to focus our talk on today. Yeah. And uh, so we're talking about hatches that are, or emergences of chronomid pupa that are occurring in water 30 feet and beyond. I don't know why. What's the game? Why? I've ever fished them is 90 feet. 90 That's, feet. That. So we're talking deep lining. We're yeah. no indicators. We're talking sinking lines uh, to imitate those pupa suspended at the bottom of the lake or imitating that emergence elevated swim to the surface of the lake. Wow. And why, you know, why do they come off in such deep water? I can all get it. No, so there's all, as we mentioned earlier, there's there's species that are that have uh, are uh, have developed in that deep water. And uh, we know that uh, there's so many chronomids that are hatching during a, a typical chronomid emergence that there can be just as many coming off in deep water as in shallow water. So we're talking hundreds of thousands of them coming off. And if they're coming off in that deep water and there's oxygen down there for the fish to be down there, mm. then it's such, chronomid pupa are such an easy food source, the trout and other fish species that eat them expend a minimal amount of energy for a great return on a high caloric value food source. And that's what it's all about, saving your energy to avoid predators and uh, being careful where you eat your food so you don't get attacked by an osprey or a loon. <laughs> no kidding. And seasonal timing for these deep water hatches. You know, everybody loves fish and crawnies in the spring. That's my time, but I'm usually shallow water. So what about these deep water chronomids? So that's an interesting question, Don. Um, in 99% of the cases, most of our deep water hatches occur late 
spring or early to midsummer. Mm. But there are lakes. I know several in the Thompson and the Kamloops area and in the Southern Caribou. Uh, and there's probably ones over in the uh, East Kootenays as well that the deep water hatches occur very shortly after ice off mm. before the shallow water chronomids even get going. And it's the only, the only um, explanation uh, it can be is that we always have to remember that everything in lakes is driven by water temperature. So the maturation of any insect life cycle is dependent on thermal units of heat in the water. So obviously in those really deep water zones, uh, the water is warm at the bottom. That's because of all this anaerobic decomposition that occurs all through the winter months. One of the byproducts is heat. So it's warm enough down there for these hatches to occur. So uh, we've got a lake with it, you know, very close to Kamloops that by the, uh, within 10 days after ice off, they're coming off in 55, 45, 55 feet of water. Mm -hmm. And there are no chronomids coming off in 5, 10, 15 feet it's of water. Too cold, it's right? Because yeah. the water's too cold yet, right? So they come off. And the only way, you know, the way you know they're coming off is you, you're out on the water and you, you see it's shocked. So you see the adults sitting in the surface film and it's 52 feet deep. <laughs> and then you look at your sounder, which is critical, oh. right, in any oh. any fishing situation. And you marking, and you start marking fish down a foot off the bottom at forty-seven feet, forty-nine feet, fifty feet, and they're between, they're they're up to a couple feet off the bottom. You know those are fish. There's nothing else they could be eating down there except chronomid larvae or chronomid pupa. So you're looking so, at blood worms or pupa down there. Yeah. So, so that's that that that's why uh, it's a typical deep water hatches don't go on for weeks and weeks and weeks. It could be ten days. It could be two weeks. Three weeks would it be would be exceptionally long. And there are definitely far more intense emergencies happening in twenty feet of water or less. But those anglers in the know that understand that there's a deep water hatch at some point uh, at the lakes they like to fish. And again, it's usually early to midsummer, but on some lakes, it's right, right, uh, right after ice off. And how do you get down there? You know, everybody says, well, I got this rod, I got that rod, I got this equipment. You know, you, a lot of people don't understand using those heavy lines to get down there when you're deep lining. So what do they require? Right? Because oh, people don't get yeah, it. So, so now that we've uh, located the sound, we located the hatches, and um, obviously, say we're anchored in 56 feet of water. Well, the way we're going to approach it is with the full sinking line, you know, type six, type seven, type eight, full sinking. And we're going to fish or present those chronomid pupa vertically, straight up and down, use the sinking line to get us down. We're going to have a no more than a three foot leader. So I would have a typical setup would be uh, say uh, 3X uh, uh, tippet material with a nail knot tied to the end of your, or loop loop to the end of your fly line. Yeah. And then I still like to use a swivel and then a foot and a half of, of uh, 4X or 5X if the, if the chronomids are really, really small. Wow. Um, and that, that's your setup. And then what we need to, to have is a, a little sinker weight or a pair of hemostats so that we can clip, clip either of those tools onto our fly and start stripping line off our reel, get down to the bottom. And then uh, I like to wind my reel up so that the tip of the rod is touching the surface of the lake. And then I know we're right on the bottom. And then I just lift the rod up a foot strip in that foot of line, wind it onto my reel, and now we know we're a foot off the bottom. Yeah, don't and, reel it up, right? You don't reel up, you strip it in. Yeah, just, <laughs> you just throw your hemostats overboard like we do a lot of times. Yeah, <laughs> so, so to help us get back to that same depth and not have to use our hemostats or weight every time, yeah. we can take a, just a short piece of 
20 pound uh, backing, fly line background backing, and tie a nail knot on our fly line mm -hmm. right at that depth that we've pegged, that we know we're, we're sitting at. And, uh, and then, so you tighten that knot up, clip. I like to leave the tag ends about an inch, inch and a half line long. And so you can keep it, keep making sure it stays tight, but it's not gonna cut in, nail knot won't cut into your fly line because you're not, we're not using a pair of hemostats to tighten it. Yeah. And then that marks your, that, that's your depth. And so you, you can, you hook a fish, it screams line off your reel, you wind, you land it by one, you winding your line in, then you reset till you get to that marker touching the surface of the lake and you know you're at the right depth. Yeah, and I got away with some painter's tape before. I brought a bunch of little masking tape. Exactly. That easy, and I put yeah. that on there and it was excellent. It didn't slide, it gave me my mark, which was really nice. And there, the big thing too, is everybody says, well, I'm gonna throw on my size 16. It's my favorite, I'm going deep and it's always caught me fish, right? It's a red and black. Are there certain <laughs> patterns that work? So obviously there's not much light down in 55 <laughs> feet of water, but yeah. there's a silhouette and those fish can see shape and they can see size. And what little light is down there does have a bearing on the size and color of the or the color of the people you put on. So we we start out, we're in 56 feet of water, we put up 14 black and red on and we catch a fish. And what do we do? We pump them. It's big enough to pump. And we see they're all they're all dull chromies. They're not black and red. So I mean, I would put on the dull chromie and the size that the real ones are. And if I don't get a fish uh, in the next 10 minutes, I know I'm not changing depth because I'm still seeing the fish on my sounder. So we've got to start going through different patterns. And we might be going to back to a black and red or black and maybe just copper or white copper colored wire. Uh, but we need to keep changing patterns till we get to the, the right one they want. And believe it or not, those fish at that depth, even at 90 feet, they can be picky. Yeah. And one thing oh. I found too, Bri, is Early in spring, and I've noticed this a lot, springtime, I'm always using small, like 16s, even 18s. A week later, pretty well 16s, you know, and as it progresses, they tend to get bigger. And by the summer, you got the bombers, but it really is lake dependent, isn't it? Yeah. No. And hatching. Yeah. There's no question that in the, in the lakes that I fish deep line around Kamloops in the summer months, that it's, it's always bombers. They're big. They're big. <laughs> Typically Our in favorites. the- no early spring hatches, they're small. Yeah. But regardless of size, we're always matching size and color, whether in 90 feet of water or in uh, five feet of water. And what about boat setup? There's a lot of people have asked us, you know, yeah. well, do I use one anchor that deep, two anchors? How, what do I do with the boat setup? Yeah. <laughs> so that, you know, regardless of the depth quantum it's coming off, there's a way to catch them. And the deep lining is, is just with you and I, we love deep lining. Yeah. You know, you can put the rod in the rod holder, <laughs> sit back, have a piece of pepperoni, <laughs> cheesy. Exactly. <laughs> and wait for that because it's it's not a subtle take. It, it's, it's, yeah. That's the fun part. They'll pull the rod over the side of the boat if it's not secured properly. That's why we're using rod. And holders. they're in the air in a heartbeat, right? The fish are down 60 feet and they're in the air two seconds later. It's amazing. It's crazy. <laughs> I love that. But what do you do? Do we, when we're that deep, do we use two anchors, one anchor? What do we do in the boat? Yeah, I know uh, it's key. Obviously, we need we're, we we need to keep the boat stationary. Um, so if it's if it's not very windy or if the wind is blowing always in the same direction, it's great to just use one anchor because having two down there, it's it's you're asking for trouble. Awesome. But there are days when it's windy and the wind is shifting, we need to have that second anchor ready to go down. Yeah. So just think if you were anchored in 85 feet of water and you had two, eight, two 85 foot anchor lines down there, there, that's a lot of trouble for fish to get wrapped up in. So mm -hmm. we try to keep it down to one, but it, if the wind is shifting, we need that second anchor. So we, we don't want that boat. Um, uh, moving around in the wind with the changing wind direction. It's no different than fishing in 10 feet of water. We need that boat stationary. Yeah, and that's why I like it. You know, I love going deeper, deep line, chronometing when it's calm. I mean, it's so much fun when it's calm. When it's windy, 
I don't dig it so much. It doesn't, it doesn't crank me out, but it's still effective. So it's good. Well, that's an awesome chat, Brian. I think we, I think we summed everything up. If, uh, you know, what, I, what we'll do is we'll put this on our member site. Um, if people have questions, they can submit the questions to us at any point. We can answer them, which would be nice. But uh, you know what? I'll let you go back and pick out the next topic for the next couple of weeks. And I think, uh, I think we'll just keep doing them. I think it's going to be popular. Yeah, no, it's just a lot of fun. And, it, yeah. you know, it's wintertime, Don. It helps yeah. us. It gets us excited. It keeps the excitement going until spring. Exactly. Right on. Well, thanks for your time, Bri. And, uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll see everybody next uh, in the next month when we do the next series. Take care. So, right on.